the future chairman of Watford Football Club is doing all right at his chosen profession. The little piano player between May 72 and October 73 turns out three superb albums that generate very hefty sales. Honky Chateau, Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano Player, and the classic Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. And the term superstar is used to accommodate this man's status. You literally turned your back on the entire industry yeah. and just walked out of it. For so long and then decided to go into Watford and that I mean w was it a hard decision to walk no, out it was on completely industry? natural I was so ups, uh, depressed I've been on the road for six years made probably I don't know it's about 15 albums and separate singles and I was just dis disillusioned with my voice my piano playing and after six years fed up with the lifestyle um, as far as like touring all the time and not have any time to myself well, a lot of records were broken during that time. Like, for instance, you know, the first, the Bee Gees, sold the, the biggest amount of albums, etc., etc. Peter Frampton, live album. And Peter Frampton. Yeah. Uh, and you broke an immense record by going to number one with Captain Fantastic the first weekend on the American yeah. Albums chart. Does the challenge become um, hard after that? Or? It's not. I'm not obsessed by it anymore. No. I'm not. Were I'm, you? No, I wasn't obsessed. When Captain Fantastic came in at number one, then I wanted the next one to come in at number one, and it did. Mm. Uh, but then you tend to want everything to be number one, and you suddenly realise you can't. Mm. And I, yeah, I did probably become a bit obsessed with being number one, and I'm certainly not obsessed anymore. Now, a New York writer uh, quoted you as saying just recently uh, about ego, that you wrote ego about a lot of people. And he quoted David Bowie and said, he said uh, that you thought he was a pseudo-intellect. <laughs> And you didn't like studio intellects, um, mm -hmm. and that the Rolling Stones, as much as they were good on stage, uh, good on record, were boring on stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you really write ego about those sort of people? Absolutely. The reflection of the yeah. 70s? Yeah. Why? Uh, uh, there's a lot of me in it as well. I'm not just saying that because uh, I just thought it was it's true. You know, there's so many. I mean, there's a report in the local paper today that says Elton John has simple taste. He only wants 28 gallons of caviar a, a day fed into his intravenously. Right. <laughs> but you know, it's. One. Were the 70s ego? Oh, yeah. The 70s were the big money era, the first big money era for the groups. Because after I changed, when I, my first record contract came to an end with MCA, John Reed negotiated a contract with MCA in America, which is the first multi million record contract. And it changed the face of record deals. Mm. Um, he also did it without a lawyer, which he's very proud of. Uh, but now, groups now that you want to sign, this new group's won £100,000 first album. And it's changed, I mean, before that, you had Be the Beatles, the Stones, they never earned hardly any money of their record royalties. I mean, they did earn a lot, but they were only on 1 or 2%. And now, groups and people like me are on 22, 23%. So, I mean, you think Ego then did dominate the 70s to some extent? Yes, it was the super groups, wasn't it? It was the mm. superstar, the megastar. When they ran out of the word superstar, they started using megastar. Well, record, record producers seem to become sort of stars in their own right in the late 70s as well. Mm. Records, record producers and lawyers. What are your opinion on record producers? I'm a great believer, as Mike Chapman made the Knack album, and he's an excellent producer of pop records, probably the best in the world at the present time. Um, you don't have to spend a fortune. Most groups are terribly lazy. They'll book a studio for three or four weeks and show up three times. I don't do that. Well, now, in, in, in 1970-71, you, you were with a three-piece group, uh, you, Nigel and Dee. Yeah. Uh, then you extended that group, and now you've brought it back to touring now yeah. with just two people. Uh, was that a gamble to go on stage? Oh, absolutely. I didn't, you see, with the band, I never used to feel uh, any adrenaline before going on stage. I was excited, but I never was nervous. Mm. Uh, on, on my own or with Ray, when before I go on stage, I'm like pacing up and down all the time. And it, I had to get that adrenaline going. I had to sort of take this, the risk of seeing whether I could actually do it right. on stage with just two people. And I, the reason I've enjoyed it so much is because it's worked. And I. It, Every night, something different. I can talk to the crowd. Yeah. Um, is it important to you to be near a crowd when you perform there? It is, absolutely, yeah. Well, how do you see music going into the 80s? I think people are still, still like the groups that they can trust on going to see perform and give a good performance, like ELO, the Bad Night, the Police, oh. uh, Boomtown Rats. I think, you know, sustaining a career as a singer or a group is very hard. And if you're not that good anyway, it doesn't, you, you don't really sustain it unless you've got a certain personality to keep it going.